Hey, Mike. Today, we're going to talk about Coke. Uh, hang on. Wait, didn't we do this? What are we doing? Uh, well, the last episode was pretty long, and we had to leave a lot of stuff out. You know, we talked about the Cola Wars and Pepsi and Coke and their advertising, and there's so much to this. I thought we could revisit part of the Coca-Cola company, its history, its products, some stuff that we just didn't have time for. Ah, uh, good. I wanted to do this. All right, let's get into it. Shall we start from the beginning? I think every good story does. I don't know. Some flashbacks. Flashbacks don't really work well in podcasts. The story starts, as many do, with the search for something to help overcome a morphine addiction. Confederate Colonel John Pemberton was wounded in the American Civil War and found himself in this addiction situation. As well as being a war veteran, Pemberton was also a pharmacist. Turns out that, that comes in handy. By the way, his injury was caused by being stabbed in the chest with a saber in the Battle of Columbus. That's yeah, well, pretty serious. It's, it's no joke. It's no joke. Uh, starting in 1866, Pemberton started to experiment with opium-free painkillers. His first recipe was Dr. Tuggle's Compound Syrup of Globe Flour. Uh, it's very different marketing than to now, in which the active ingredient was derived from the button bush, a toxic plant that is common in Alaska. He next began experimenting with coca and coca wines, eventually creating a recipe that contained extracts of the cola nut and Damiana, which he called Pemberton's French wine coca. According to Coca-Cola historian, sidebar, Coca-Cola historian is a pretty cool job title. It's a good job. It's a good job to have. So according to this historian, Phil Mooney, the soda was created in Columbus, Georgia, the site of the very battle that wounded Pemberton, by the way, uh, but quickly ended up in Atlanta, which, of course, now we know is the headquarters to the Coca-Cola Corporation. The cocktail was prescribed for all sorts of ailments. It could both calm down the nervous and give energy to the lethargic. It was, in short, a miracle drink. Still is. In 1886, Pemberton was forced to create a non-alcoholic version to his French wine coca. During its development, it was blended with carbonated water by accident, and the fountain drink was born. At the time, it was believed that carbonated water held many health benefits, so it was still sold with medicinal properties on the signage. At this point, the main ingredient, coca, was still present in the formula. Pemberton called for five ounces of coca leaf per gallon of syrup, which apparently, according to the internet, is a significant dose. In 1891, it was claimed the formula contained only a tenth of this amount, and in 1903, it was removed altogether. But even at five ounces, the amount of coca in the beverage was pretty low by volume. I don't think many people were, like, getting stoned out of their minds drinking this stuff. Let's back up a bit from 1903, because there's, there's still a little bit more to uncover. Indeed. So by 1888, things were getting complicated. There were three versions of Coca-Cola sold by three separate businesses on the market all at the same time. Pemberton died in 1888, but the brand lives on as he declared that the name Coca-Cola belonged to his son, Charlie. But the other two manufacturers were free to continue using the formula, just selling it under a different name. Around this time, Asa Candler bought into the company. It's a little unclear when this exactly happened, but Candler said under oath in court that it took place in 1887. In March of 1888, Candler founded Coca-Cola Company, with the entrepreneur buying out the other shareholders later that year. It's also unclear when and how Candler acquired the rights to the name. One of several stories floating around is that Candler bought the title from the name of Charlie's mother for $300, approaching her at Pemberton's funeral in 1888. That is savage. Yeah. <laughs> what a time to move in. But whatever happened, by August of 1888, Candler seems to have had complete control of the beverage, the company, and its name. In 1892, Candler founded a second corporation, the Coca-Cola Company. <laughs> and the next one is real Coca-Cola Company. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> For realsies this time. <laughs> Years later, it was alleged that several signatures on the original paperwork had been forged. Oh. Not wow. much came of this, however. <laughs> and on September 12, 1919, Coca-Cola Corporation was purchased by a group of investors for $25 million. The company publicly offered 500,000 shares for $40 a piece. This is the company. This is the company's history. But we should actually talk a little bit about the drink itself in a bit more detail, because, oh boy, does it get interesting. What do you think? Uh, yeah, sounds good. 
Let's take a break first and thank our friends over at Squarespace. They will let you easily create a website for your next idea with the ability to grab a unique domain name, take advantage of an award-winning template selection, and so much more. No matter what type of site you want to make, Squarespace has the tools, whether it's a store, a blog, a site for your business, or just about anything at all. There's nothing to install, patch, or upgrade. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform. They have 24-7 support, and you can sign up right now for a free trial. Go to squarespace.com slash ungenius and when you sign up for a plan use the code ungenius for 10 percent off that plans start at just 12 dollars a month but you can get that 10 percent off when you use the code ungenius at checkout once again that is squarespace.com slash ungenius to find out more squarespace make your next move make your next website over the 20th century coca-cola became well known for its advertising Ernest Woodruff, who took over the company in 1919, said it was his goal that everyone on Earth drank Coca-Cola as their preferred beverage. I like a plan that just says on the tin what what it wants to do. Like, I yeah, respect like that. How Relay FM wants to be the only podcast provider that ever exists, right? That's where we are, too. We're taking a page out of Woodruff's book. Of course, there's a wide use of Santa Claus, we talked about this last time, enjoying an ice-cold Coke while delivering presents around the world. That started in the 1930s, while the word Coke became a trademark in 1941. Coca-Cola branded murals can be found painted on the sides of old buildings across the United States. These are called ghost signs and often date back decades. This is when you see a wall, and these are all over the place. It's not just Coke. It's all types of of businesses and advertisements. But you look at a wall and you see like a faded painted sign. Mm -hmm. That's a ghost sign. Coke ads can be found in almost every brand of media. The company moved from print ads to television right onto the internet and other digital media. It was the first commercial sponsor of the Olympic Games way back at the 1928 Games in Amsterdam and has been an Olympic sponsor ever since. And we would like to welcome Coca-Cola as a podcast sponsor if they're ever, if they're yeah. ever interested Email in us, such Coke. a thing. Just let us know. Since 1978, Coca-Cola has sponsored the FIFA World Cup, and its marketing has also included Major League Baseball, the National Football League, National Basketball Association, and the National Hockey League, as well as many teams within those leagues and others. Once you start to think about it, you realize you see the Coca-Cola logo basically everywhere. There are some places in the UK where the actual billboards, the the plastic frame of the billboard has the Coca-Cola logo on it. Like my assumption is Coca-Cola bought that billboard and just put their advertising in it, which is an abnormal thing to do based on how other billboards work. I find that to be kind of a little bit fascinating. Yeah. So we spoke a little bit last time about how the company keeps the recipe of Coke a secret, right? The idea that only two people know about it at at a time. And if one of them dies, there's a, a successor must be brought in and it's really secret. Now I was super interested about this. So we did a little bit more digging into the way that the formula is kept a secret. So over the years, several people have published what they claim to be the formula. But the company maintains that the actual formula of Coca-Cola has not yet been discovered and remains a secret. There's actually a vault like at the Coca-Cola Museum where they say the recipe is like in the vault. I'm not sure I believe that or not. I don't believe it's in there. I don't believe it's in there. Like I, I bet that's just a prop. There's no way they put it in there. If they care about it so much, don't tell people where it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the recipe has changed over time. So Coca-Cola inventor John Pemberton is said to have written his original recipe in his diary shortly before his death, but his writings do not include when or how ingredients are mixed in. Coca-Cola's recipe was certified kosher in 1935, but it's forbidden during Passover due to the inclusion of high fructose corn syrup, which is a change made in the 1980s after the new Coke debacle. On January 23, 2011, a commercial aired during the NFL football AFC championship game in which Coca-Cola teased that it would share the secret formula, only to flash a comical, and I'm putting in air quotes, formula for a few frames during the ad. When paused and closely studied, it is seen that it's just another marketing ploy, with nutmeg oil, lime juice, cocoa, vanilla extract caffeine, flavoring, and even a smiling face listed as ingredients. 
Over its history, Coca-Cola has actually used several different stimulants. We talked about cocaine earlier, right? Coca is cocaine. Uh, this is derived from the coca leaves. Pemberton's original formula had quite a bit of coca leaf present, but later this was reduced. Coca-Cola once contained an estimated 9 milligrams of cocaine per glass, far less than what you see in a movie when someone does a line of coke off a table. It's a significantly different amount. Experience. Yeah. Coca was removed from the recipe, like we said, in 1903. After 1904, instead of using fresh leaves, Coca-Cola started using spent leaves, leftovers from the cocaine extraction process, which is trace levels of the drug. In modern times, however, Coca-Cola uses a cocaine-free coca leaf extract. Of course, there is caffeine in Coca-Cola. That is today's stimulant. Coca-Cola currently contains 34 milligrams of caffeine per 12 fluid ounces. The drink used to have far more caffeine in it, but the amount has actually come down steadily over the years. So last time we raised this question about if the recipe is a secret, how can anybody actually make Coca-Cola? All right, this is clever but complicated. The Coca-Cola company only produces a syrup concentrate, which it sells to bottlers throughout the world. The bottlers produce the final drink by mixing the syrup with filtered water and sweeteners, and then carbonate it before putting it into cans and bottles. To produce the syrup with the secrets remaining intact, Coca-Cola ships nine separate ingredients, with the only thing on the label being a number. These are called the nine merchandises. They don't state what the ingredients are, and the syrup factories are just given the needed proportions of each number. But it goes further. The recipe is not made up of nine discrete ingredients. To help keep things even more secret, some of these merchandises include multiple ingredients that are mixed together at amounts created at the Coca-Cola factory. However, over time, some of the mystery has faded. Four of the merchandises have been uncovered. Number one is sugar. Number two is caramel coloring, three is caffeine, and four is phosphoric acid. There is also a lot of legend for some reason surrounding merchandise number seven, which has been later dubbed Merchandise 7X. It is thought to be a mixture of essential oils, including lemon, lime, and orange, and considered by some to include lavender. I love all of this. I just, I love this so much. The nine merchandises? It's very cool. It is. Today, Coca-Cola is sold in every country except North Korea and Cuba, where it can still be found. It was introduced in China back in 1927, but then removed from sale after 1949 for 30 years until diplomatic relations between the U.S. and China were restored. There are some consumer boycotts of Coca-Cola in Arab countries due to Coke's earlier presence in Israel. A Coca-Cola fountain dispenser was developed for use on the space shuttle as a test bed to determine if carbonated beverages could be produced from separately stored carbon dioxide water and flavored syrup, just like we see like in gas stations and stuff, but could that be done in a low-gravity environment? The machine flew on two shuttle missions and totally worked. That is awesome. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> Coke in space! That's right. Today, Coke is at the center of a large portfolio of over 500 products produced by the Coca-Cola company. Yeah, it ain't just soft drinks anymore. They make everything. It's it's wild. This list, as well as soft drinks and bottled water and sport beverages, includes mixed drink ingredients, soy-based ingredients, and more. Since 1987, Coca-Cola has been traded as a Dow Jones Industrial Average stock, but has been public, like we said, since 1919. One share of stock purchased in 1919 for $40, with all the dividends reinvested, it would be worth $9.8 million dollars, in 2012. So if your grandparents left you a Coke stock, go dig it up. You're rich. The company has a market cap of roughly $194 billion. That is a lot of fizzy drinks, my friend. <laughs> it really is. Mm-hmm. Fascinating stuff. It really the is. The merchandise is. I love it. Yeah. Should we look at podcast distribution and seek nine discrete secret containers? I think so. It, it really feels like there's a movie waiting like just to be made about this, like someone trying to, to find the secret ingredients and, and working them out. It's a movie I would watch. If you want to learn more about Coca-Cola, say you're going to write that movie, you need to do some research, we have some links for you. If you head over to relay.fm slash ungenius slash 61, a bunch of links about Coca-Cola, its early founders, the formula, lots of stuff to go read. While you're there, you can send us an email, you get in touch with a show topic, or you can do that on Twitter. The show is at ungenius. You can find Mike there as I-M-Y-K-E, and you can find me as I-S-M-H. And until our next trip to the soda fountain, Mike, say goodbye. Goodbye.
Adios.